Hey everyone, Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this video, to this channel, and to this entire world of healing, trauma, nervous system health, and all things neuroplasticity. Today I want to talk about kids and whether or not the work that I offer specifically in my online programs and courses, the neurosensory exercises, that is the practical form of the work that I teach. Um, I did another video on what that is um, earlier this year, last year. Um, so check that out. I'll post it below if you want to check out what these exercises are. But those in the course, or those maybe looking to find ways to help their kiddos heal, um, they ask the question, can kids do these exercises? And the overarching answer is no, they cannot. The program, the coursework is geared to adult learning. It's geared um, for those of us as adults wanting to apprentice and heal and rewire our nervous systems after a lifetime of chronic stress, abuses, adversities, etc. Um, so the answer is no, but I'm going to give you some examples, about three or four, um, to show you how the work integrates to how you interact with kids, infants. Now, I have done a lot of videos on the importance of raising, I call the, call one of the videos healthy humans. I'll post that also below. Um, I'm not today gonna get into the whole aspects of um, attachment and ventral vagal aspects of the parasympathetic and what it takes to help a little one learn self-regulation through co-regulation. These are all very important terms that if they are unfamiliar to you and you are interacting with infants, if you have an infant yourself or you're about to have an infant or you have grandchildren, be sure to watch and take in some of those um, videos and, and, and resources because it is very important. I will say this, when a little one comes out, they are not hardwired to know how to be in the world and self-regulate their nervous system, their emotions. They need to learn via co-regulation from us. And the better we are at our own self-regulation, our own capacity to listen to our internal cues, something called our interoception and the cues from the outside world, the more um, natural, the more organic, and the more just easy it is to be with these infants, with these kids. And so an, uh, a general thing I hear from my students when they start to do the work for themselves as they find themselves naturally changing how they interact with kids. They start changing how they, or they see them differently. They see them from a nervous system point of view, from this more trauma informed point of view. I like to say human informed. I did a video on that a little while ago. I'll post that below. It was a special topic lecture where I, where I talked about what it means to be trauma informed and really at the end of the day, we, we need to be human informed. We need to be nervous system informed. So I'm gonna give you three, I think, examples. I've got a list here so I don't forget some of these vignettes, but I'm gonna talk about three things that I teach my students. One is orienting. One is learning how to follow impulse, biological impulse, and one is working with anger and healthy aggression. And I'm going to explain how these practices that I would teach an adult who maybe doesn't know how to orient, follow impulse and access healthy aggression, how when we get that on board, we can start to integrate those concepts with our young or with the kids that we're around, if we teach kids, that kind of thing. So if we start with orienting, so as a basic kind of definition, and I've done two videos, big videos on this, I'll post those below too. I encourage you to check those out if you don't know what orienting is. But we are teaching a person, an adult, in those le these lessons how to re-engage with the world, with the vision, the hearing, the senses. When we have had bad things that have happened to us, when we are stuck in some form of PTSD, complex PTSD response, chronic pain, these sorts of things, we can get pulled out of the here and now. We aren't even aware of what's around us. Some might say tunnel vision. And so part of healing, part of restoring our system is to bring back this orienting to the environment concept. So let's just say you as the student have learned how to do this and you're actually starting to naturally orient to, the, to your environment. 
even under times of stress, you realize, oh, wow, I can actually connect to my environment and see things. And, and that's a way to resource and bring the nervous system survival stress physiology down. So you have a kiddo, let's just say a five-year-old, and maybe they're not even stressed. But one way to start to teach them orienting, it isn't to say, okay, little Johnny, we're going to sit here and we're going to look at look at the wall, we're going to look at the sky, we're going to orient. No, they're too young to understand that. But we would go outside with them and hey, say, hey, look at the bird over there. Or look at the thing in the window over there. Or when you're driving and they're sitting in the back of the car in their car seat, hey, can you see the whatever it might be? Remember those games that kids used to play? I don't know if they still play them when they're in a car, they're trying to kill time and you try to find things that are red or games like Simon um, or I Spy with my little eye, I'm getting my games mixed up, something that is orange. And we engage with the environment through these games. So with young ones who can engage in that way, of course, right? This isn't gonna happen necessarily with a one month old, but with the kids that can cognitively talk to you and look and you can guide them and show them. And then you might say, hey, can you find some other birds in the sky? Or can, you know, what do you see out there on the lake? Or what do you see over there um, when you're sitting in your house and you're looking outdoors? Usually nature is a really good way to bring the orienting process out, but it doesn't have to be. Um, if you think about even reading a book with a child um, or reading to them, they're, you're pointing. Usually when you're with a children's book, you're pointing, they're seeing, they're nodding. This is all natural ways of connecting with the environment and other elements while being connected with a human that is older and regulated or more regulated, I should say. So try to find ways, if you again have ch children and kiddos, to engage them with the natural world. This obviously means that if you're outdoors with them, you have to engage with them. Now, of course, they might be on a play set or, or a swing set and they're playing with their friends, then great, let them do their thing. But if you're with them, engage with them, connect with them, have them orient with you. I'll say one more thing around this, um, specifically around infants. I live somewhere here um, in my city where there's a lot of walking paths. I see a lot of young parents with infants and strollers. So often I'll see the parent, and this isn't really a judgment, maybe it is, I'm not sure, but they'll be staring at their phones or they'll be talking or listening to a podcast. And you kind of know they're listening to a podcast because they're not talking back. And they have an infant in the pram and the infant might be fussing, they might be crying and they're not engaging with them. We need to be alert to what those little ones are doing so that when they need us, when they need a little connection, when they need a little soothing, we can go and pick them up or talk to them. The other thing one might say is, well, if they're just sleeping and not doing anything doesn't matter. I kind of say it does matter because they're still sensing if our attention is there with them, right? So use that time if you are someone that has a little one and you're strolling around to be meditative, to orient yourself, to see around you, to look both ways when you cross the street, to connect with that little one energetically. The other thing is if they are awake and they're not fussing, and they're just looking around, talk to them, you know, talk to them and be like, oh, do you see the, the birds over there? And maybe you stop every now and again and you point. Obviously, they're, they're not going to talk back to you. And I think we get into some trouble when often parents will say, oh, well, they can't talk back to me. So what's the point in talking to them? This is how we gain communication skills and they hear and they listen and they see our facial affect. And that's how they learn just human, just to be human. So orienting can happen in lots of different ways, but I wanted to cover that in terms of sort of the kiddos, toddlers, young children, but also that we can orient to infants and help them orient, but it just has to be tweaked a little bit. 
All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is following your impulse. So this means, I often joke in my classes, this isn't the impulse to eat all the cookies in the cookie jar. This is the impulse to, to act on what's being felt in our physiology. One of the more simple examples would be, I have to go to the bathroom, there's a toilet over there, I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna hold it in. Um, if I have the desire or the need to pass gas, letting it happen. If I'm hungry, eating. If I'm not hungry, not eating. If I'm thirsty, drinking. I think you get it. The other element of following impulse is there's a desire to cry. If there's a desire to sing, if there's a desire to move, to stretch, to yawn, to let those things out and through. The biology is giving us these cues for a reason or these responses, these desires, and we really want to listen to them so that we can re either literally relieve the system or express something or nourish ourselves or not harm ourselves by, let's say, overeating. So this is something that my students learn and it takes time. And the reason why this is important is so many of us we're never allowed to follow our impulse. It could be a food thing. Think about how many children have been forced to eat their dinner when they're already full. Um, if the, you know, if you don't eat all your vegetables, you're not going to get dessert. Threats, you know, force feeding, but also it can be the opposite. A little one saying, I'm hungry, mom. I really, I'm hungry. I need a snack. And mother's saying, you know, no, you're not hungry or no, not now. Dinner is in an hour. Wait. Now, of course, a child isn't going to die if they're not malnourished and they don't eat for an hour, but they're listening to their physiology, right? And they can sense that there's a drop probably in their blood glucose level. Now, of course, we want to make sure that this game with food hasn't started where it's a reward, where um, I want the candy because for whatever reason, right? Because it gives you a hit of that sugar. This means that you have to start that process really young, where you're, you're teaching your children, you're teaching whomever you're around yourself to listen to those impulses and really listen to them and really act on them. So if we think of kiddos, same kind of idea. It's not to, um, you know, if they're like, oh, I just want the candy and give them the candy. It's like, well, you often will hear this. If you're really hungry, then you'll eat a carrot. You know, and that has a little edge of a threat to it. But again, it's like, okay, well, how, how about here? We could have some nuts or we could have some carrots or we could have um, whatever it might be, a little piece of tuna, whatever it might be. You give them options to choose from. I learned this in when I, when I was doing applied human nutrition in university, that when they did studies with kids that were really young, I can't quote the study in the name of it, but children did much better when they were given a choice of a range of foods. So you would give toddlers, I think it was, you know, apples and carrots and nuts and bread and crackers, um, meats, proteins, cheese, all on this, this table or tray. But they would also put candy and sweets. And most of the time, if not, I believe all the time, the children actually went for the healthier options. And it just was there as a teaching point to us that variety is really important, especially with little ones. And they intuitively know what is good. And the trouble with threatening not having dessert, if you don't eat the vegetables, that sends a message into that little one's system. Well, the vegetables must be really bad if I'm gonna get a reward of something that's really sweet. So nothing wrong with sweets and desserts, but when you put them in this kind of valence of, well, that's a reward if you eat this stuff that you don't really like, the question is, maybe they would have liked it if we didn't put that kind of condition and that um, just really it's a conditioning that we've given kids that these vegetables aren't, are, are taste funny and, and they're good for you, but you're not gonna like them. So we're gonna give you a reward if you eat them. I hope that's making sense. So to go back to following impulses with kids, food is one way to really work with that with them, to let them express what they might want, um, to engage them in the process of, let's say, 
food and food selection and cooking. I think all too often children are not involved in that process. And of course it depends on the age. Um, and then the other thing with following impulse, so here's another example. Um, and I'm gonna use an example and a vignette. A little while ago, again, I was by this park where I live and there was a little boy who wanted to hug the tree, no joke. He said, daddy, daddy, I wanna go and I wanna hug the tree or touch the tree or something like that. And dad said, no, we have to keep walking. And I could hear this happening. I'm like, oh boy, we're gonna have a meltdown soon. And sure enough, the little one just started crying. There was a bit of a tantrum that came out. And then he tried to essentially stop the children, child from expressing this expression, this survival energy, and just kind of kept tugging him along because they needed to get back to the car. I have no idea what they were doing, but here's the thing. What is the harm in letting that child touch the tree? There is an impulse coming from his system, his or her system, to go and be and connect with nature. Who knows why? It doesn't matter. Chances are, and of course I'm making a prediction here, if we had gone up to that tree or gone with them to that tree and touched it, it would have done something for that little one to self-regulate. Who knows? For the parent, it probably would have been good for them to go and touch the tree too. We all know that the importance of being in the biome and being with nature is super important for our systems. So, you know, go to the tree, touch it, orient. Oh, look at the moss, look at the dirt. Oh, do you know these are called roots? Those are leaves, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, there's a squirrel in the tree hiding his nuts. This is how kids learn. This is how they connect with us. My sense is if that had, had have happened, they would have been fine. Little one would have felt that, that impulse be um, accepted. There would have been a nice connection with Papa, and then they would have gone off to the car with no worries. Okay, third thing, anger and healthy aggression. This is a huge topic. I've done lots of videos and articles on this. I have an entire playlist on my YouTube channel with anger and healthy aggression videos. We'll post that below so you can binge and work through that. I also have some articles that I'll post. Now, humans need to express their anger. It's one of our basic mammalian emotions. I'm not gonna get into how this gets sidetracked. I've done some videos on the development of healthy aggression and what it is, so be sure to watch those. But one way that we can help kids express their aggression and their fight energy is to play with them. Um, I'm going to give an example. A acquaintance of mine has, I think, a six-year-old-ish, five-year-old, and school has been quite stressful for a lot of kids the last little while. And um, she knows my work a little bit, the mom. And so she knew that one specific day was incredibly stressful. And she's not gonna say to her little one, hey, so today was pretty stressful. Should we get some anger out? You know, do you, do you need to express your feelings? That won't register at age five, but what will register, and she did a great job, is going out to the soccer field and kicking the soccer ball around. It doesn't have to be soccer. It could be tag. It could be hide and go seek. It could be um, playing some music and dancing and 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 pounding the, the, the feet on the ground. You know your kids best, you know your grandchildren best, but it means you have to engage with them and be energetic and get them up to what we would call a threshold of activation that that sort of resembles is a proxy for that survival impulse of anger, of healthy aggression, of energy, of force, using the hands, using the feet, getting the heart rate up, and then coming down, right? And kids are super resilient, they're very smart. If we give them an opportunity to express like that, they might not need to release any emotion or any anger, Maybe some tears come out, maybe they don't. But it's much better than ignoring that the stress happened and just hoping that nothing blows up later. Often what I'll hear is, let's say there's been a stressful day at school or something happened, and if that isn't released proactively, 
Later, there'll be a meltdown. Later, there'll be a, a difficult behavior. But basically, when kids are kids, young, and adults too, if our biology is unwell, if our biology is holding on survival energy, these fight, flight, and freeze reactions, um, it will drive the behavior. So it will drive aggressive, violent behavior. It will also drive being shut down and not wanting to engage behavior. It will drive fatigue. It will drive irritability. It will drive appetite changes. It will drive sleep disturbances. So there is super duper importance in playing with kids, getting that aggression out. You know, back in the day we had recess and gym class and, and we would walk to and from school and all these ways that we would get that energy out. And from what I know, a lot of kids right now aren't doing that. So we have to help them access that kind of movement, that kind of expression. Um, I am not a big believer, I'll, I'll say it right now for the record, in kids doing things like yoga and meditation where there's structure and they're having to sit still and be mindful. I don't think kids need that. I think they need to play, they need to exercise, they need to be listened to, they need to express their impulses, and they need to learn to orient to the world and have fun. Um, someone I know has a great blog on kid, all on children. Her name is Janet Lansbury. Um, I'll post that below as well. I wrote an article for her um, blog ages ago on the dangers of tummy time. So be sure to check that out. I think it was one of the most commented on and shared articles in her history. But she has tons of articles about the importance of play. I think she had one article that said something like, up until the age of, I think it was six or so, the only learning a child should have is play. No math equations, no trying to be perfect at spelling or reading, but play. It brings in our movements, it brings in our body, it brings in our interactions with the world, with others, with our imagination, our creativity. We need to let kids play. So to wrap that back to the original question, which was, Irene, can kids do your neurosensory exercises, which are the practical pieces of my work, my online work? The answer is no. However, you as the adult, you as the big person can learn the theory, the practices for yourself. You work on orienting yourself. You work on following your impulse yourself. You work on learning how to express your healthy aggression yourself, your anger yourself, your emotions. And then you integrate and you get creative with the kids. You get creative with them and you help them. You help them express themselves. You help them feel safe. You help them learn what resourcing is, things that they like, things that they don't like. Um, I'm actually recording this just before the holiday season, but this will probably go out in the new year. Um, if one of your little ones doesn't want to hug an auntie or a grandparent, don't force them to, right? Do not force children to be affectionate with family members who they hardly know, who they never see. It is very unsafe, especially when you walk into that house for the first time, it's Christmas dinner, all these people are around, they're a little disoriented, they don't know what's going on. Wait until there's interaction. Wait until they hear the grandparent or the uncle or the grandma or the cousin speaking and interacting with them. Then they'll get curious. Then they'll get interested. Then they'll come up and maybe they'll give a spontaneous hug to one of the family members. But please do not, do not force them to be affectionate um, with family members or your friends. They're your friends. They're not your kids' friends. Right, so um, I can't tell you how many times I've been around um, people's children and I never see them and they want them to care for me, but they don't, they don't know who I am, I'm a stranger. And I've been in, a, in some awkward positions where I've had a kid come up to me and hug me and I could feel that, that they are not wanting to touch me because they don't know who I am, I'm a stranger. So that's another thing is to really honor kids and what they're feeling and what their desires are. Of course, we still need to teach them right, right from wrong. We need to teach them boundaries and disciplines and chores and all those things. That's another topic for another day. But at the end of the day, the work that we do with our kids is basically interacting with them, 
teaching them, letting them follow their impulse, keeping them engaged with the world, engaged with themselves. And um, if you can do that, a lot of good stuff will happen. All right. Hopefully this has been useful. Thank you for listening and we will see you next time.